Thank you. Thank you, Shimie, for the introduction. And also, thank you all for coming to this talk. I know how busy everyone's schedule is. So really appreciate that. Uh, my flight was delayed for six hours. I didn't get in here close to midnight last night. Uh, so I will try to stay awake. <laughs> if you see I'm falling into sleep, just wake me up. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts about GI science in now an increasingly hybrid physical virtual world. Uh, so before I started pre uh, preparing for this presentation, we all have been playing with chat GPT, right? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, why well, not chat GPT to give me uh, a break? So save me some time on this. So I asked chat GPT, please construct a PowerPoint presentation on this topic for me. It did come up with outlines of slide one, slide two, slide three, slide four, then stop it. <laughs> Uh, so it was not very helpful. Then I was trying to figure out how my view of hybrid physical virtual world would be different from what's discussed on the internet. So I also then asked ChatGPT, uh, what is a hybrid physical virtual world? It can be several paragraphs. Now it's better, okay? But still not exactly what I would like to talk about. So eventually, I had to work it out myself <laughs> to prepare this. And the chat GPT, I'm sure you know it, it's been in the news, and uh, we can spend time talking about chat GPT. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. But uh, we don't have enough time to talk about chat GPT uh, here in my talk. But chat GPT is part of this increasingly hybrid physical virtual world. So if it takes off, then it could be tomorrow's Google. Yeah. And uh, what, you know, there are several main differences between Google and the ChatGPT, but we will talk about that as some other opportunities. Yeah. So uh, those of you who have been using GIS, uh, we know GIS has been quite useful in many different uh, fields and uh, to address different kinds of problems. But there are also some major limitations. GIS in terms of my perspective. So in today's talk, I'm going to share two major limitations. The first one is, I think the conventional GIS approach has pretty much neglected humans. So if we try to handle humans in the computing environment based on GIS, it's very limited, it's very limited. But a lot of the major challenges we are facing on climate change, sustainability, to uh, uh, smart cities, we cannot forget about humans. That's the foundation of all these challenges. So how can we do better uh, in terms of handling humans in GIS? That's one uh, aspect I'm going to uh, share some of my ideas. The second one is because GIS have focused on locations in absolute space. If you look at Google Maps, you see a map, okay? And the locations of different places. I don't think that's sufficient to address many challenges we are facing in today's hybrid physical virtual world. I will get into that discussion uh, in the remaining slides. So if we look at the conventional GIS, it follows the traditional cartographic concepts. So we represent locations in this physical space using these static map layers, land use, translation network, topography, and so on and so forth. Okay. This is very much based on the Newtonian concept of absolute space. And uh, we have been using Euclidean geometry, Cartesian coordinate system to implement the so-called GIS. And uh, this particular conceptualization of space is not the only way to understand space. And uh, this conceptualization of absolute space is good, but it's not enough. That's my argument here. So I talk about humans. So uh, in the last 10 years, and she uh, and I also have been working on this topic, and we call it human dynamics, but I need to provide some background 
what it really means. So I was a transportation geographer, and uh, also I took courses in planning, uh, civil engineering, psychology, and so on and so forth, where I was a graduate student. Uh, so I worked on transportation and GIS during the first part of my career. And then, you know, I thought, hey, why do we need transportation? We don't need transportation for the sake of transportation. We need transportation because we need to move around to fulfill our different needs. We need to go to work. We need to uh, social. We need to exercise. We need to see friends and so on and so forth. So if we think about the foundation of all this, okay, we human beings have different kinds of needs. We need to eat. We need to sleep in order to survive. We also need a job to make a living. We need friends, okay, to be mentally healthy. And also we have goals. We want to fulfill those personal goals and so on and so forth. So human dynamics refers to all types of human activities and interaction. Now they take place both in physical space and in virtual space to fulfill those different <laughs> needs. Okay. So traditionally humans in GIS, they are considered as numbers or HPU data in our database. We can create a semantic map showing the population distribu distribution or a point density distribution for population across the continental US and uh, or for interactions, okay, we can show it as the flows between different locations in absolute space. But we humans are not static entities. We are dynamic and living entities. So if we think about big data, all these tracking data we have, GPS, other kinds of tracking data, if we use traditional GIS to represent, for example, uh, this data set was shared by colleagues in France back like 15 years ago. Uh, they collected GPS data of different people uh, over six months period of time. And uh, then they saw our work and they say, okay, can you can you handle this uh, data in your uh, system? So they shared the checking data individual down to individual labor with us. If we use maps to map it out, that's what we get. Uh, can you all guess which country this is? French. France, yeah. And uh, which city is that big dark set? Paris. Paris. Okay. And the people travel around. And uh, we loaded this, this into our space time GIS. So the vertical dimension now represents time. Okay. And uh, six months. So if you come, there should be, we have 52 weeks in a year. So uh, six months, there's uh, 26. So if you come, there are 26 uh, blocks here for each week. Okay. So for this particular individual, based on the checking data, for example, we carry out cell phone. In fact, this kind of data is available. Okay. Uh, what kind of activity pattern does this person have? Work in Paris every weekend, went to the beach. Okay. And uh, stayed at the beach, didn't come, work, come back to work. And so on. So, so just visualization part, we can better understand individual activity pattern. This can be used for transportation, mobility, uh, you know, uh, infectious diseases. Okay. If we have all this, that's during COVID 19 and so on and so forth. If we ruin, we can even see which particular day this person skipped work. Okay. So without any analysis, just visualization. So uh, different people have different patterns. This, this person moved around quite irregular, irregular. So we can do all this in a space time GIS. Uh, we did this about 15 years ago. Uh, we developed this prototype system. So each line represents, we call it space time pace of each individual. So their movements across space over time, each line represents one individual. And uh, all these main players can move uh, along the time dimension. And also we can rotate it in any way you want to look at it and so on and so forth. It's better, but is that good enough? Really think of humans. Now, still locations in absolute space. Uh, 
But now we are living in an increasingly hybrid physical virtual world, uh, especially of this the so called modern information and communication technology, our cell phones, internet, and so on and so forth. So, in physical space, how do we move around? We rely on transportation systems. To move from one location to another location in order to carry out different activities to fulfill our different needs. But now in virtual space, what kind of tools do we use to navigate in cyberspace, in virtual space? ICT, our smartphone, internet, and so on and so forth. And uh, more importantly, what we do in physical space, they are not isolated or independent from what we do in virtual space. Okay. So they actually influence and are influenced by each other. Uh, we talk about this in publications also back more than a decade ago. Uh, so then the important part is how can we treat humans as dynamic and living entities? Okay. And then we navigate in both physical and virtual spaces. So, for example, I move from Facebook one person's page to another person's page. It's like I navigate from one virtual place to another virtual place. And I move from Facebook to Amazon. Again, I move in uh, the virtual space. Okay? So, how if we want to understand a lot of these human behaviors in today's world, we cannot just look at this because we'll get a partial picture. And whatever the conclusions we draw from data in physical space only will not tell us the full story, okay? So we do need to handle both. But then, how? But before we get into how, uh, there are many different forms of hybrid physical virtual world. So we use Amazon to order something in virtual space. Then those packages still have to be delivered to our location physically in physical space. So that can be considered as a hybrid physical virtual. And uh, Google, uh, Facebook, TikTok, okay, all are the different kinds of uh, examples. And uh, then digital twin has become a buzzword again recently. So uh, digital twin. Basically, we have an object or a system in the physical space. We try to create a digital copy of that physical object or system as accurately as possible. And then we have all these channels pacing the data between the physical object and the digital copy of that work. So it can be used for all kinds of simulations to solve, address many important questions. This, the current GIS still can handle it to a decent degree. Why? Because this is physical system. So we can still use the locations in absolute space to create a digital copy of it. And, uh, but now we are, We are moving into this so called AR, VR, uh, XR, and so on and so forth, even metaverse. So, what are the implications? So, for example, AR, AR is basically an interactive digital environment based on the real world objects and uh, enhanced by digital information. So, how many of you ever played Pokemon Go? That might reveal your age a little bit too. Uh, that's an example of AR, okay? And uh, you know, we can certainly overlay this different kind of information on top of physical world, okay? So this uh, is the so-called AR. And then if we move into VR, VR will provide more immersive environment for interactions. And uh, also VR can emulate what we have in physical space. But VR also can create an imagined space that doesn't exist in the physical world. Okay, so if it's uh, emulation of physical space, that's not too bad. GIS can still 
uh, be useful. But if it's a completely imagined space uh, with totally different kinds of space concept, then it can be different. Okay. How many of you play Second Life? Second Life has been around for quite a while. So if you are not completely happy with your life in the physical world today, you can get online to play Second Life. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, you can Google and, and try it. It has been around for quite a while. Okay. And then once we move into metaverse, okay, why, you know, there's no universal definition for metaverse today. But one easy way to understand, you know, if it works, if it happens, then it could be considered the future version of today's internet, okay, uh, applications. And uh, one key characteristic of metaverse is the physical space and the virtual space they are fully intertwined with each other. Okay, it's much harder to separate these two. So, you know, we could get in a metaverse like this. And uh, how many of you have heard a platform called Sandbox? What is Sandbox for? Sandbox is a metaverse platform. So many well-known big companies, they have purchased Land established their company headquarters in this metaverse. Okay, but so what are the locations of those land? And in fact, it's in Fortune magazine two years ago. One piece of land sold in metaverse online. The average price was higher than apartment in Manhattan. People are paying. You can you can Google Fortune magazine for that piece. And also now there are companies which are selling this. Now we work from home, but you want to have physical presence. They sell this kind of robot. Okay. And uh, some of these are tunnels. You can move around, knock on the door of your colleagues, and uh, talk to them. Okay. Even though you are staying at home. Uh, again, you know these they, they are products from relatively low price to very expensive price there. So that creates a more immersive, immersive kind of a, a physical virtual world. And also in my definition, I don't limit virtual space to only cyberspace. Or you don't have to have computers to be in virtual space. For example, if we think about traditional phone calls, okay, that could be a virtual. And uh, our social relations, in our lives, not Facebook friends. This can be still virtual. Okay. So, what are the implications of this kind of hybrid physical virtual world? So, for example, if I ask you, what is the location of Google? Where is Google? What would be your answer? Where is Google? Somewhere in the cloud. How do you create a map for Google? So, how Google represents Google in Google Maps? So it you know does bring up some interesting question, and uh, definitely Google could be represented in many different ways. We could use the street location of Google headquarters in California. Park Duck say, okay, that's Google. Oh. Google is simply a URL in the virtual space. And the same URL changes from country to country. And then you ask the same question, you might get different answers, okay? Using those different Google URLs. Or it could be their server locations, okay? The IP address of different servers. That's how, you know, online, they keep track where we are. Okay, once you get into Google, they know roughly where you are based on your IP. IP address, okay, and uh, or oh, Google is just Google, an identity. It can be represented in many different ways. For example, where I am depends on when, because it's dynamic, okay. So then the important question is: RTS and GIS science today ready to handle all these kinds of human dynamics in this? hybrid peaceful virtual world. 
and uh, you know my answer. <laughs> okay, uh, probably not good. Uh, even though I'm the president of <laughs> a professional association of GIS science. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, I and my co-author, who used to be a faculty member of GRPD, Ben Sui, Daniel Sui, now is the uh, VPR, uh, uh, Vice President for Research at uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, we co-published a paper in the annals of Association of American Association of Geographers in 2020, and this is the framework. So conventional GIS is centered on locations in absolute space. But we argue that now we want to change that. We want to put humans in the center. Okay, because a lot of the challenges we are facing today, they come start with humans. And uh, we must consider humans as dynamic living objects. Okay? In this case, if we rely on location in absolute space concept only, we won't be able to handle a lot of data and the uh, challenges efficiently and the effectively. So we introduce other concepts, locale in relative space. That's your local context, your surrounding environment. Okay? I will give you examples in a minute. Also, relational space with identity. For example, in social network, online social network, in most cases, we don't care who is physically located where. We just want to know how we are connected with each other. And uh, also mental space. Okay? For example, uh, we, we were talking about power system. Now we have these smart meters, smart meters. So uh, utility companies, power companies can Real time manage our use of electricity or gas. Okay. Uh, so they come up with all these incentives, coupons, and so on and so forth, trying to change human behavior. Okay. But do you think everybody would respond, react to those incentive programs in the same way? No. Or if I ask, do you think charge station is a safe city or not very safe? Do we, do we think everybody would have identical perception? Probably not, right? That's what we mean by safe place in mental space, okay? Then what are these? So absolute space, there's conventional GIS based on locations of different features in the physical world, and we organize them into the different main players, which have been very useful, will continue to be useful. I'm not arguing we need to abandon it. We need to keep it. but. This alone is not enough. Okay. What do I mean in terms of locale in relative space? For example, now indoor, indoor navigation also is getting attention. So how many of you navigate inside the building using XY coordinates in your mind? No, <laughs> we use the local context to orient ourselves, right? That's the locale in relative space. So when we develop all the apes, that's more intuitive to human beings rather than, hey, you are exactly at this X, Y, Z and the move. Okay. Also, so that means surrounding environment, local context, the situation we are in become more important okay, in relative space, not locations. Autonomous people. We all hope autonomous vehicles will work. So GIS people also think we want to get into autonomous, autonomous vehicle business. Okay. So I ask my colleagues if GIS is going to support navigation of autonomous vehicles, what is the positional accuracy of our data required? If we build a GIS database for the world or for the state of Texas, what is the position accuracy needed to support the operation of autonomous vehicles? In any case, in terms of GPS, we know roughly 10 to 50 meters. That's probably not good enough, right? <laughs> if it's going to be autonomous vehicle, minimum, it needs to be able to recognize individual traffic lanes so it can stay in the lane. That means three to five meters. How about parking in New York City? 
what would be the position accuracy level one? Much, much higher, right? Okay, is it possible to build a global GIS database at a position accuracy of five to 10 centimeters? Is it feasible? Yeah, you know, technology, technology is safe, but it's going to be very expensive. Or oh, even we build a global database at that high position accuracy level, how often can we update it? Even though you can update it on a daily basis, don't forget, we human beings, all those vehicles, all those bicycles, all those animals, children, they don't stay at the same location. They keep moving. So conventional GIS, in my view, totally collapsed. If we rely on conventional GIS to support autonomous vehicles, it's not going to happen. But we all know autonomous vehicles are mounted with all kinds of sensors. How accurate those sensors can collect data? Down to millimeters. And we only need to know how surrounding objects at that high accuracy level. Right? So that's local context relative space. So all we need to do is to come back. What we have into conventional GIS with the relative location data, then problem solved without investing additional money. Right? So, and the, during the COVID, that probably was the first time uh, Google and Apple actually worked together. <laughs> what did they do? They developed this app. What was unique about that app to do contact tracing during the COVID? Did you notice this news during the COVID? What was the main concern from individual perspective if all of us are being tracked down to the GPS label, GPS location label? A lot of privacy concern. Okay, so one key difference between this app and GPS tracking during the pandemic was they use Bluetooth. Bluetooth basically, we only need to know whether or not, whether or not you are within proximity, certain proximity of other people. We don't know, we don't need to know exactly where you are. So that helped address the privacy, privacy issue to some degree. Okay, but sometimes we don't want people to know I was with this particular person. <laughs> okay. um, but you know, that's relative space. Okay. And there can be used in a relational space. Now we are all familiar with our online social networks, Facebook and so on and so forth. And uh, even Zoom meeting. Now there are some people who are online watching this presentation and uh, I don't know where they are. I don't need to know where they are. So our connection is basically in relational space. Um, so in relational space, our focus is more on the topological relations, not actual location, absolute locations in absolute space. Okay. And uh, this has been studied by different people, including David O'Sullivan used to be at UC Berkeley, now moved back to New Zealand. Yeah. So this, you know, really not new, but not widely uh, used. And also, these kind of relations exist in both physical space and virtual space. Okay, we can have a friend network in physical space too. Okay. Hey. And uh, this was published in 2009 in Journal of Transport GRB. We did this uh, to try to combine the absolute space and relational space. So if you see a red line, there's one particular person's space time pace. So locations across space over time. And then if you see a gray line, there's some physical entity, like a restaurant, uh, library. So if you see a gate on a gray line, that means during that particular time window, the facility was closed. You cannot access it. And if you see a blue line, there's a virtual entity, like we have Zoom meeting, teleconference, or uh, Amazon Inc. to do online shopping and so on and so forth. So this allows us to tie this together. So those four different concepts, they are not absolute space, relative space, relational space, and mental space. They are not independent from each other. 
they are actually associated and the inference uh, linked with each other because what you do in one space can affect uh, your behaviors in other spaces. Then mental space. This is uh, focusing on the mental and the cognitive aspects of humans. So for example, I did a search of Chinatown in New, in New York City. This is what I get from Google Maps and what I get from OpenStreetMap. What's wrong here? Google Maps actually gives you a boundary of Chinatown. OpenStreetMap also gives you a boundary of Chinatown in New York City. In general, they cover that neighborhood, but they are different. Which one is correct? Can we tell which one is correct? Is there a correct answer? There's no official boundary of Chinatown. Chinatown is perceived, created by people's perception and understanding. Okay. We also published a paper a few years ago, how we could use all these photos posted online to help us better understand how people perceive the boundaries of these different uh, places. I don't have time to get into that. But this is an example. How do we handle these kind of features okay, uh, in GIS? And also autonomous vehicles. Say one day, when you try to cross the street, a car can stop, but engine was running. So you look at the driver. What was the driver doing? He sleep because he's a autonomous vehicle. How many of you would feel comfortable to cross the street in front of that car with engine running? Stanford University actually did an experiment. Most people were behind the car. Why? Because you don't trust. Then why do we trust all these cars now when we cross street? Have you thought about that? Supposedly humans are even less reliable <laughs> than computers. What we do is eye contact. So we often look into the eyes of the driver, make sure the driver sees us. Then we feel comfortable crossing. But you cannot look at the autonomous vehicles. So how do we solve this problem? What kind of AI do we need? You can signal when he saw somebody. Exactly. We don't need fancy AI. All we need is that autonomous vehicle will blink the light. That blinking means I see you. You can walk in front of me. So it's just a communication. That's how human works. So, you know, when we design all these so called smart systems, if we forget about people, then we could make an easy answer, far more complicated okay, to solve the problem. And uh, so that's the communication. Another scenario, we also have construction loans, right? And the people will hold the stop sign. Go, stop, go, stop. And uh, can autonomous vehicles recognize that stop sign? No big deal, right? Image recognition, no problem at all. So autonomous vehicles are so good to recognize stop sign and the stop. Now, if this happens in New York City, I want to crash the traffic in New York City. Oh, I want to crash the traffic in College Station. What I could do is I order 500 t-shirts. Front, back, print, identical stop signs. I give out free to students. They all wait and they walk around in College Station. Those autonomous vehicles are so good they will see the stop sign and stop. So this is an example of both mental, okay, mental part as well as relative. That means a canvas vehicle needs to understand the local context to interpret what that stop sign really means, really is. So, so these are some examples just to uh, share with you. 
Okay. Uh, let me quickly summarize uh, uh, the frameworks and get into a couple of uh, quick examples. Uh, so absolute space works with absolute locations in space. And uh, our focus is on um, answering questions such as where are the different uh, objects, especially in physical scale. <clears throat> and the res relative space works with relative locations to a fixed or moving object, like autonomous vehicle is a moving object in a relative space. And uh, so the, we focus on questions such as what are around the, the local context, the locale. And uh, relational space works with relations to other objects. And we try to answer questions such as what are related to us. Okay? And uh, like uh, energy. Okay? So we have all these geopolitical relations, which certainly have important implications to energy demand the supply. Okay? Uh, Mental space. We work with cognitive and mental aspects of space and uh, try to answer the question that what do people have in mind, okay, to perceive, to understand all of this. And uh, we connect that with different concepts of place. So in absolute space, our concept of place is more on location. And this can be easily represented by XY coordinates. That's what conventional GIS does. And uh, we connect the concept of locate with relative space. Our focus is on the local context. Local context can be at different scales. Okay, can be at different scales. It can be within 100 feet, one mile, or whatever for your problem domain. And the relational space is mainly focusing on identity. Okay, so we don't really need to know the <laughs> location of each person, but we do need to know the identity of each person in their relational space. Uh, mental space is associated with sense of place, okay? And uh, try to reflect how people perceive all this. And uh, the same kind of policy in middle-income neighborhood versus low-income neighborhood, people can perceive it very differently. The same smart city application can be perceived by different populations, uh, groups, different. Or the same act may work in one country and not in another country. So that summarizes uh, this framework. So we hope we can handle data okay, from those different perspectives. Depends on the type of problem we want to answer. We don't have to have data in all four. Okay? If these two are good enough, we simply use these two. If those three are needed to answer a particular question, we, we use those three. We don't have to have all of them. But the important thing, the fifth circle is they need to be in with each other. They are not isolated when we try to answer questions. So recently, we tried to use Google Maps to illustrate some of these ideas. So the system itself is very primitive. Okay, so I know I talked to some uh, of your colleagues here. Some of them are experts of visual analytics. Some, some are experts of big data, AI, and so on and so forth. Uh, what I'm hoping is we can share this framework as a platform. Then people with different expertise who need to address questions in different problem domains can all work together to use different tools to develop different functions. Yeah. So collectively, it could become future Google, <laughs> okay, Google Maps 3 or whatever. Uh, if we look at Google Maps, how do you select a restaurant when you go to a city you are not familiar with? How do you choose a restaurant? Search nearby. Search nearby. Reviews. And use Google Maps. Yeah, and uh, if we pay attention to Google Maps, that me gives you a map. You know the location in absolute space. You also can look at the map in terms of the local context, right? As you can see, if you change the display scale, different POIs pop up. One interesting question is, which one come up first? <laughs> which could influence your behavior, okay? And uh, Google controls it, okay? So we have absolute space, relative space, but relative space, you have to figure it out as the user, okay? 
uh, Google does not summarize like ChatGPT does. One major difference between Google and ChatGPT is Google gives you a list of all the references. Then you have to sort them up, okay? Find the useful information. And the uh, ChatGPT will give you a summary of what it learned. And so, you know, uh, Google Map, we still need to pick out the relatives located. Uh, and also, have you used the people also search for? What's that? Other suggestions? Yeah. So, Google aggregate all these searches and to say people who search this restaurant also search these other restaurants. So, that's one. That's a relation space. And then, okay. So, but now we have to look at them individually. Okay. It's hard to connect all this together in Google Maps. So, what we have done, uh, also, Google gives you the rating. Right? Gives you the gives you all the comments. We have to read through the comments and uh, get better ideas. So we could use text mining to derive key perceptions of the, a particular restaurant based on all these individual uh, comments and then give you a summary, for example. Uh, so this is what we have done. This is completely uh, we want to be open source, okay, and uh, runs. In, in any web browser, okay. So we can actually look at the same thing. Actually, Google Maps, okay. These four views. This is a screen capture of the system. Uh, so we can look at the location, the absolute space, and uh, quickly, if you click on anyone, it will tell you the context. So we see a certain distance. How many this type of restaurant, Asian restaurant? Okay, how many Italian restaurants, how many French restaurants, and so on and so forth. So, gives you some ideas in terms of your choice, your option. Also, from the marketing, from the business perspective, how competitive it is, okay, in that local context. And uh, we have this relational space showing how people search among all these different uh, uh, POIs. And uh, the mental, the mental can be displayed. These are just examples. You can implement it in the way you want. Okay. So we could. I've been working with some people who are good at ontology and text mining to provide better visualization and uh, tools for this. Uh, so if there's 100 feet, it says only one southern food restaurant. If I change that to 200. Then it says one American restaurant, one Mexican restaurant, 3,000 restaurant, and so on and so forth. So that's the local context. And uh, we're looking to show you this and so on and so forth. And then you can also click anything from the relational space. And it will update other views okay, to show you related information. You can also click. I mean, sure. Okay. You can click in the mental view. For example, now we can see it's an isolated small network. What do you think these restaurants are? They are all related to donuts. Okay, so people who are looking for donuts, they are they do not search for other kinds of restaurants. Okay, so you know by integrating this together uh, can give us a more comprehensive picture. Uh, and our student also work with me in terms of food access, especially during the pandemic. Okay, so uh, he also implemented the space time test uh, I showed you. So if you hover your mouse cursor on any space timeline, it will give you the description of that particular person. For example, this is an elderly person, handicapped, so on and so forth. Okay, for example, in uh, uh, to provide better services to the NB population group, okay, and uh, they request government services, we could have this kind of data, okay. And uh, uh, then we also use other views to show other things, okay. I will show you. We can click on any particular person, okay, then it will give us information about that particular person. The three different colors here reflect the food access opportunities in physical space versus food 
accessibility in virtual space. You can order something, okay, uh, online or hybrid. Hybrid uh, during the pandemic, many of these grocery stores, for example, or you can do online order, then you drive to the parking lot, then put it into your truck. Okay, so you know there are different ways to do this. So this can help us better understand in terms of the food access for different uh, individuals in physical space, virtual space, and uh, uh, the characteristics. For example, this person has far more limited choices. Okay, and also we try to better understand. Even though you don't have a car or you are handicapped, cannot do certain activities uh, to get food. But if you have a friend network, you have a support network in your relational space. You are, for example, many every people, they don't feel comfortable using those apps on smartphone, but their kids can order something for them, okay? And uh, deliver to them. So this shows if you have two friends who are willing to help you, how they could expand your possibilities in terms of accessing food. Yeah. So there are different ways to implement this to address different kinds of uh, challenges. Yeah. So let me conclude. Uh, so we hope this human-centered space-based geofence framework is closer to how we do. And uh, also, we hope this framework can make GIS and GIS science more relevant and useful to our colleagues in other fields who need to address different kinds of uh, challenges in terms of meeting different kinds of human needs. And also, uh, we hope this framework can better support human dynamics research in a hybrid physical virtual world. And uh, more importantly, we don't think we can do everything by ourselves. So uh, we would like to find people who are interested in this and work together. So for example, uh, we are looking for good use cases of this framework. So can we use climate change as a good use case to show if we can incorporate all these four concepts? Will then open up some other possibilities and shed additional light on the different questions we want to answer sustainable development smart cities and so on and so forth and public health yeah so we said thank you all and uh